I'm going to go and let them all introduce themselves. But we have a ton of experts in the startup space here tonight, uh, founders, startup lawyers, uh, VC members, board members, the whole works. Um, so why don't we go through and each person introduce yourself and tell us um, you know, what, who you work for, um, what startups you're a board or advisory member of, or a founder of. Great, I'll go first. I'm Allison Ryu. I'm a managing director at a VC fund called ABLE Partners. Um, ABLE is an early stage fund that invests in consumer brands under the umbrella of positive living and health and wellness. Um, the fund is based both in San Francisco and New York and invests in pre-seed, seed, and series A rounds. I will admit that I recently joined ABLE in the last month, and prior to ABLE, I worked at a fund here in San Francisco called Circle Up Growth Partners, which is also a consumer fund where I had the opportunity to sit on five boards during my time there. All consumer companies, including Kosas Cosmetics, the Coconut Colt, which is a probiotic yogurt brand, Nut Pods, a non-dairy creamer brand, a Mented Cosmetics, and Pop and Bottle. Um, so I'm excited to be here tonight and look forward to meeting many of you afterwards. Hi, my name is David. I'm at a Menlo Park-based venture capital firm called DCM. We manage about $4 billion and we invest across China, US, Japan, and Korea. Um, I'm actually on Justin's board and we invest primarily in Series A, Series B companies. And in addition to that, I also serve on a few of the startup boards in the FinTech, retail, and uh, consumer startup space. Awesome. Thanks, my name is Ryan Connor. I'm in a startup called Atrium. Uh, was one of the early attorneys there, and I also lead a consulting group there that's called Fundraise Concierge. Uh, so I've helped companies raise about $3 billion on the legal side, and also just from a capital perspective, about $500 million while we've been uh, at Atrium as well. So um, again, a little bit more technical background in terms of corporate governance, but have also seen fundraising from a uh, strategic business point as well. I'm Justin Wong. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lark. Uh, Lark is a hydration company that uses technology and design to help uh, people access safe drinking water in a more sustainable and healthier way. Uh, our first product is the Lark bottle. You could go on liftlark.com to check that out. Uh, but we recently raised a Series A, uh, partially uh, with, with David. Uh, David sits on my board, uh, and prior to that, uh, we were, uh, I've been involved in both investment banking to private equity all the way through to uh, other startups in the CPG space, sat on several boards myself, uh, so kind of have seen that from both sides of the world. Um, so yeah. Pretty cool that we have a founder here tonight and one of his board members. <laughs> I'm glad me for a discount code after. Yeah. <laughs> How lucky we are. Um, so Ryan, uh, why don't you kick us off and break down the difference and the functions between a board of directors and advisory board versus a board observer, and when are the different boards formed? Like at what point? Sure. So uh, I think the easiest way to think of it is in terms of a startup timeline. So if it's just a few people and you're working together, you may not have product market fit, you may have a few customers but you probably don't have like an institutional funding round, meaning you don't have an investor that has really done a priced round yet. It's probably just going to be a few people. And when you have outside people that want to help your company that may be experts in their field or investors, you're going to want to call them advisors. And you want to make sure that you have something in place that defines the relationship. Because uh, it's sometimes those people that can come back and, and haunt you in the end. Uh, but those informal relationships at the beginning are really called advisors. And from a high level perspective, they don't really mean anything. Um, but they can be very valuable when you do go out and raise uh, a seed or A round to say, hey, we have this great team. But it's a pretty informal structure. Uh, with one step up is what you call the actual board of directors. You're not going to generally put in place what you'd call an outside board member until you have an institutional funding round, meaning you have an actual priced round and you're selling preferred shares. Again, that's most of the time. And that's when you're going to bring in an outside institutional investor to sit on your board. That board member, uh, because they're officially on your board of directors, has a number of uh, voting controls and can do a lot of things at the company, and it's a much more formal relationship. 
Uh, if you have too many preferred directors on your board, uh, you can get fired as CEO. And that's uh, what a lot of people talk about is protecting your board uh, control and protecting yourself as a founder. So it's really important to understand that early on when you do do your first priced round. Uh, the last thing that was discussed is what's called a board observer. Uh, the board observer does not have any real power in the board, but it means they receive all the information and they're allowed to attend all the board meetings. Uh, a lot of investors that may not lead the round may sometimes ask to be a board observer. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, board observers are not necessarily a bad thing. Um, however, if you have like a corporate strategic investor that might be an acquirer, uh, it might be problematic to have them on the board and have them privy of all the information when you do receive a term sheet. Uh, but generally at a high level, I usually don't uh, push back on what's called observer rights. Awesome. Allison, typically founders start with an advisory board, as uh, Ryan mentioned. What are some of the greatest benefits to having this type of board prior to fundraising and going through a priced round? So Ryan did a really good job kind of teeing this up in that an advisory board in many ways is a lot less formal and requires less investment on the legal and documentation side. It doesn't have the same corporate governance and requirements that, are, that come along with starting a true board of directors with your institutional round. So I would encourage any early stage founder to have advisors around him or her to be thought partners, to challenge you, to think about things through a different lens. I think it's really important early in your journey that you're not solo in your effort, but actually seeking out diverse perspectives. I also think that advisors are wonderful in that they can grow with the company, but they also are not permanent. So you may use an advisor for a year and decide that that expertise they brought to the table is no longer as relevant, and it's easier to part ways and, and mutually agree with an advisor to move on than it is to change the structure of your board of directors every year, which is pretty, pretty challenging to do. Um, the last thing to note that Ryan can also speak to from the legal side is that a board of directors is going to have a fiduciary duty to the company. So again, it goes back to that formal corporate governance and on the governing docs that um, circulate a, a board in general. And I think what's important to know is an advisor is really a thought partner for you. Um, they can be uh, quite thankful. Quite, quite frankly, a therapist. If you wanna call them on Saturday morning and talk through all the things that went wrong that week, an advisor can play a kind of broader role in helping to be um, really valuable early on. Totally, adding emotional support too. Um, so David, a board of directors is typically outlined in a term sheet. Uh, once that term sheet is signed, uh, when does the board officially form and who are the typical first board members? Your typical first board member is who leads your first institutional round. So sometimes at the, as early as seed round, we'll form a board and that's gonna be a pretty informal kind of like just, well, it's gonna be one comment, so you need to the CEO. They might bring in their co-founder and then the preferred shareholder will be the first board. That'll be a three person board. For a whole host of reasons, boards are usually odd numbers. Um, the simplest reason is because you don't want a deadlock with the, you know, two votes inside, two votes on the other side. And then usually most boards are formed at the series A. Um, and that, at that point, you have like a lot of governance in place, you have a lot of, um, you want the oversight, and then you want actually, most important thing, one fund to have a lot of skin in the game and to step up for you, whether that's fundraising for your next round, making good connections for sales, helping you hire, and having that board member and that uh, institutional person have a lot of skin in the game, and being that person is really useful for a startup at this scale. If the board was uh, formed earlier, perhaps like at the seed round, what happens to the original board members in a series A? So usually they'll retain their board seat and then the board will expand or what you'll see is a lot of seed funds will step back and move into an observer role uh, or they'll vacate the board seat altogether. So oftentimes when a seed investor forms a board at the seed round, usually by series B or C, they'll either vacate the board or move into an observer role so that a later stage investor can take a board seat. So follow-up question to that, um, how do the seats get allocated? Are they compensated? So you know, you said sometimes they become a board observer right. from seed to series A. How do those seats get allocated? Honestly, that all depends on how much leverage the founder has and how hot the round was. We had a portfolio company that uh, at the series A was able to obtain three seats for common and gave one seat to preferred. And that was because the round, there were a lot of term sheets chasing the company. Um, usually how it's allocated is there's a good balance between how much power the management team retains and how much power the preferred shareholder retains. 
Um, so it just all de kind of depends on how much leverage you have. But that being said, you don't want to start in a very adversarial position in the very beginning with uh, whoever finances your company. You probably want whoever invests in your company to also be on your board. Those things usually are uh, one and the same. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Justin, do you have any experience or anything to add there with the going from seed to Series A board members, positions changing or seats being allocated differently? Yeah, so we had a somewhat of a unique situation. We were actually spun out of a larger technology company originally. So we skipped the seed round. Uh, we were part of a corporation that kind of funded the seed round. Uh, as a result of that, uh, our parent company and later uh, supplier became held a couple of seats uh, on, our, uh, on our board. So I think board hygiene is really important. Uh, you know, we kind of inherited some of those seats. So it's a little bit of a unique situation, uh, but I think the best practices on the board still apply. Um, and then we evolved and brought on new board members and after we raised a Series A, uh, that took that seat as well. Um, but going to David's point, I do think it's important to have an odd number of board members because uh, ultimately, as no matter how successful you are as a company, I do think uh, controversies or disagreements will arise. So you really want to plan ahead uh, for, for those situations and kind of uh, scenarios where not everyone's on the same page. What makes a good board member versus a not so good board member? And obviously, the odd number is the is the choice. But how many is too many, and how many is not enough? Mm -hmm. David, cover your ears. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, is, this is a general question, so. I mean, Feel free. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, I think a really good member is someone that, you know, is going to just do more than check the box. Uh, you are inevitably going to run into a lot of situations where maybe you haven't been there before. Maybe, um, you know, as a VC investor or a later stage investor, they've seen many, many versions of different problems uh, and seeing you know, companies navigate similar situations. So they could be a sounding board. Uh, so I think for me, at least, it's more important, uh, you know, the person that's on the board rather than the fund or the name uh, and kind of the value they would bring to the table. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, it's not the name that you're, you know, when you go out and execute um, on your business, whatever it is, I think it's the people around you that's gonna really help out. Um, so I think with that said, you know, someone that's going to support you, someone that understands your industry, someone that's going to be willing to carve out time to actually listen to you and to think through that problem. At least for me, that's more helpful than someone that's kind of have a big name or uh, can make a lot of introductions. How important would you say, like, diversity and thinking, culture, background is when it comes to seat allocation for board members? I think it's extremely important, um, but obviously it depends on your... Ability to make those choices. Yeah, the ability to make those choices. Uh, I think bringing a different, having alignment on your corporate culture and your business culture uh, is extremely important, but also being able to bring in uh, a different point of view. So I do think you want some balance of different personalities, and I think you want some balance in terms of what each person brings to the table. Um, I think on our board, uh, there are some people that are extremely uh, sound technically or come from a more of a technical background there are people that are you know better connected uh, so depending on how you are uh, what are some of the potential problems ahead of you over the next 12 to 18 months um, I think you want to structure your board accordingly to potentially help you solve some of those things the only thing I would also add to that piece about kind of good board member versus bad board member is remember that in, from the investing perspective, we are in a service industry. So a lot of, I think, founders are um, in a position to demand that your board prepare in advance, spend time with the materials, dig through and prepare your questions, hopefully send that to the founder or management team in advance of the meeting so they have time to prepare. But definitely the good hygiene around um, sending out an agenda, having a deck sent in advance so that your um, board can actually come to the meeting with kind of thoughtful uh, uh, recommendations or questions is really important. 
The only other thing I will add to that is I would also recommend finding board members that are comfortable challenging you. So as much as support is incredibly important and um, I think key to, to a successful relationship, I think you also want someone who's going to be able to sit in the room, know that they know far less than you because you are the founder of the company, but be able to ask those hard questions and engage with you in a thoughtful way. Um, I think the people who are there to just nod their head and say, great job, are, are not gonna ultimately help you that much in the long run. Yeah, so that's your like diversity and thought. You want someone to be able to provide a different perspective than the one that you have. Uh, so Allison, how often should you hold board regular board meetings and what happens during the meeting? Can you walk us through like a typical meeting, the topics, voting, post meeting, follow up, et cetera? So on average, and there's no specific or right way to do this, most boards get together four times a year, quarterly. Um, as I mentioned kind of in my previous comments, I think it's great practice to send an agenda in advance of a meeting, actually collect and solicit thoughts in advance so you can guide the conversation in person, less about flipping through and going through every single slide and more about spending time on the areas that your board actually finds really important at the time. Um, so when you're actually in a board meeting, you typically, in terms of good corporate governance, have potentially a someone representing your council there to take formal minutes. And at the beginning of each meeting, you actually approve the minutes from the prior meeting and start kind of a fresh slate, knowing that that um, participant will be taking notes throughout to document kind of the key decisions, votes, um, and conversation throughout. And then during the course of a board meeting, it really is going to depend on what your board wants to spend time on, but it's not uncommon to be spending time on those key KPIs that you've discussed, a forecast, thinking about key hires and the org structure. It can really run the gamut depending on where you're at in stage of company, but also what's relevant. Um, I think what's important though is that everybody is participating and up to speed. So I have seen founders in prior examples say, let's take a 10 minute break because they can tell one of the board members is perhaps behind or needs a second to catch up or read up. I think it's important to make sure that the conversation feels like everyone's on the same page and ready to dive in. And that's really in your control as the founder to help guide that and make it a positive dynamic. Um, I also recommend after following a board meeting, there's gonna be a ton of follow-up. Many of the things might relate to things you need to run down, but it's great practice to write back to the board to just recap everything you've discussed and make it very clear where there are to-dos or follow-ups that they own, that specific board members have agreed to make an introduction or will follow up to get you into X you know, distributor or whatever it might be. I think uh, that email is a great place to document um, what happens next in case it's lost in the kind of wrap-up of the end of a board meeting. I just can't stress enough that point. Just make the most use of your board member as humanly possible because they have a portfolio of maybe 10, 11 companies. So they're, I think they think about you maybe once a month at most, but you think about your company every single day. So just use your board members as much as possible. Justin, as the founder on this panel, how do you structure your board meetings and how do you stay on topic and not let conversations, you know, like go down a rabbit hole or get way off on a tangent? Do you have regular chats or a Slack channel to communicate with your board members on a regular basis or any strategies there? Sure, uh, I think as a founder, sometimes to be honest, like board meetings and preparing for them can be, can feel a little bit like a pain, but it's one of these things just like exercise that, you know, it's good hygiene, you have to do it. And you know, if you don't do it, actually it, it makes things worse down the road. Um, so I think it's important to keep that in mind. We also meet formally every quarter, but in between every quarter, we also have a typically a phone call, uh, a board call that's typically shorter. Uh, we distribute the agenda ideally three to four days ahead of time, uh, see if there is any questions so people can be prepared. Uh, but I think more importantly, uh, we also try to get together with, with each individual board members once between every board meeting. So whether that's a catch up lunch or coffee, uh, or chat about specific topics. Um, I think that one-on-one -on -one intention is really important as well, um, because you know you might be, you know, you might need something for a board member that's very specific to their skill set, and that's not as relevant for the whole group. Uh, or just you know having building that relationship one-on-one, -on -one, I think is extremely important. I think that the other thing that's super important about board meetings is that it, it might seem like a, a little bit of an administrative hassle, but the more up to speed that your board members are. Uh, the more likely they are going to be able to help you. So if you neglect that, right, and you come, oh, all of a sudden you're fundraising for a Series B and they're not up to speed. They don't know what you need or you need something and they, you know, they're going to not going to be thinking about you as much. So the more, in, to David's point, the more you stay in front of them, uh, I think the more likely that you're going to get some help. 
uh, when you need it. Can you give us an example of a topic that you discussed at like one of your last board meetings or like what is like the actual discussion or something? I mean, you don't have to go deep, but if you can't, that's also okay. You can say. What's the actual, like the topic? Just discussion. like an example of something that was in discussion at one of your board meetings, just so that we get an idea of like what's actually being discussed in a board meeting. Yeah, if we talk about fundraising, we're constantly fundraising, so we're always thinking about the next, next fundraise. So I work actually with David very closely about uh, our fundraising strategies as well as potential targets. Uh, David's obviously uh, very well connected in terms of with other funds and you know people that might be interested in this space. Um, and you know we do a lot of that, uh, but also updating you know the board members on the business so they're aware of you know what the highlights are, what the lowlights are, how we on track to hit certain. Uh, milestones and KPIs. Um, so it's not just, you know, we try to keep it balanced. Uh, a lot happens for a CPG company in Q4. Uh, there's a lot of good news and there's a lot of misses. So, you know, we try to, you know, go through that. And I can give another example of yeah. helpful um, to answer the question, um, which is a little bit more on the cultural side. I was recently in a board meeting where the founder was talking about um, challenges with the head of sales, and it wasn't performance challenges. It was actually cultural kind of uh, leadership challenges and how to think about building team, um, what it meant to invest in this person's development, but at the same time kind of really need them to step up and be a senior leader of the team. And they were not necessarily seeking out a vote from the board to say, do we fire this person or keep them on, but rather the thought partnership and knowing that everyone around the table had the best interest of the company in mind, how to navigate and potentially leverage some of the examples from other companies we've been part of and experienced, how we could help um, work through that challenging situation. Um, so I do think personnel does come up a lot, and it's a common theme in um, the boardroom to have to work through, um, because building is very different at the seed stage than it is at Series A, and those growing pains are very natural. Okay, so we have some questions here that I think are really good. Um, how much percentage of shares does a founder need to hold to have good leverage on a board? This is an open question, so anybody want to take this one? Okay, Feel free. It, it depends on what the uh, terms of your round were and wh like whether you need like a simple majority to make a decision, basically hold on to your job and not get fired, or you need like super majority. It really kind of depends, but I mean, usually every founder, every single round gets diluted 20 to 25 percent, and so usually after the Series A or Series B, that founder, uh, honest truth is, they probably don't hold enough shares to no longer keep has control. From getting fired if they're doing a poor job, and that's governance, right? Because if a founder has a lot of control and they're doing a poor job and they're running the company uh, poorly, whether it's business or, or culture, the board probably should have the, the ability to remove that founder or at least bring in someone that's like a COO or a president and bring in that founder. So yeah, that follow-up question, can you fire a board member somehow? What does that look like? Yeah, uh, just one quick thing. The percentage ownership in your company doesn't matter um, at all, actually. It's, it's what your board structure is. Uh, if you own all the board seats as a founder and you own 1% of the shares, um, you, you won't get fired. Uh, so a lot of people look at the percentages that they own in a company, and economically that matters, uh, but it, it generally doesn't matter in terms of your, your governance. Um, it can matter, like with the WeWork example, for example, uh, he has the super voting shares to control the common as a shareholder class but the actual percentage of the company you own really never really comes into play. Uh, what does matter is how much you own of the common class, because that is actually what controls the board seat generally, or whether you're the CEO or founder. So uh, when you start thinking about like, am I gonna get fired? You wanna think about that board vote um, and how much of the common you own and who controls those actual common seats. And it can get a little complicated because sometimes, um, even if you, uh, if, if you leave the company or you get fired on the board, you can still actually vote yourself into one of the common seats, but the language can get very tricky because it can say the person has to be serving uh, in capacity as a consultant, director, um, or officer of the company. So you wanna be kind of really careful there uh, and do the analysis at the board level and the voting level and not at your ownership percentage level. All right, HM, figure that out for you. <laughs> no, no yeah. So going back to firing, can you fire a board member? How do you do that? What does that look like? Is that even possible? 
never actually gone through that heavy fire divorce. No, but I guess from a legal perspective. You probably could, right? Yeah, you, you really can't. Um, uh, it's it's uh, there's there's not a whole lot in there. Uh, we've had some funds that have dissolved, really, or something's happened to them, um, and there's really you kind of have this ghost situation where generally there's like a attorney of that fund that is kind of acting as custodian. Um, but there isn't really a situation where you can really get rid of a board member. Uh, most funds, if someone does something really awful, will, will want to take that person off the board just from a PR perspective. But that fund will generally replace them with someone else at the fund. Um, so they're, they're like really- Like a swap swap them out but what happens in the documents is each fund has a right to that board seat um and they can always you know generally they designate who from the fund serves on that portfolio on that board but you really can't like remove someone for bad behavior or anything like that i guess to add to that real quick i think one leverage point you do have as a founder is obviously um the when you raise a new round, oftentimes you're able to dictate some of the terms or work out some of the terms, and that could be uh, one way, uh, if there's a strong enough term sheet, to be able to remove a board seat, potentially, or to replace someone. So that is an angle. When new money comes in, that's oftentimes an opportunity to reshuffle or to reorganize a little bit. You, you want to be careful with that because um, your current board has to approve that term sheet. Yeah. So if you not, not this is not a situation that we're going through, by the way. We're um, but, <laughs> right? We're good, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you don't have a good relation with your current board or they don't approve of the new round of financing, that could jeopardize that round if they don't approve of the round because you legally can't, well, you can't sign a term sheet unless your board approves. Um, so just be careful with that. How negotiable is which partner at the Investing VC comes on your board? you know because oftentimes like a lot of the bigger name firms and a lot of bigger firms will um, potentially They'll choose in, invest in a deal and then it'll be like a, a very famous GP or general partner and then once the deal is done to say okay my my principal or my VP is gonna take the board seat um, and then the founder is gonna say well I I did this to work with so-and-so um, and then so oftentimes when we've been faced with that situation what we'll do is say okay fine this junior person can take the the board seat but the um, more senior person has to be a board observer and has to attend every single board meeting or at least call in. So in that way, you can kind of get around that. But I, I don't think there's much you can do. Um, either you can say, we're not going to take the money, or you kind of can say, well, we want your advice, we want your time, even if you're not a formal board member. I would focus a little less, though, on um, specific title or, or wanting it to be a general partner. I think Justin alluded to this earlier. I would focus more on finding the right fit, um, that someone you feel comfortable spending a lot of time with and have good rapport with, especially if it is someone perhaps at the principal or, or vice president or uh, that level, they're really going to be wanting to prove themselves, right? This is going to be an important investment for them, an important board to, to serve on and do well on. And so I think incentive-wise, you actually often are in better hands with someone who might be at that level than someone very, very senior whose career has been made. This might be their seventh board they're on this year, and it, it is a bit of an afterthought. So I wouldn't worry as much about title. I'd focus a lot more on who you feel really comfortable with and have built that relationship with while negotiating your term sheet. Justin, what are the most common board member pitfalls that founders make? Um, Any? I think I alluded to some of this earlier, but you know, I definitely agree that some of it is uh, keeping uh, a good hygiene and keeping people up to speed. It can feel, speaking as a founder, when we're preparing board minutes or board material and it's midnight on a Tuesday, it, it can feel a little bit uh, burdensome and you know administratively heavy. But you got to keep in mind that, like David said earlier, it's you know they oftentimes they think about you once a month, and as a CEO or a founder, it's kind of your job to be. Uh, the point of communication or the funnel where the board connects to the company uh, because your director of sales, your VP, that's not their job, that's your job. So I think keeping that in mind is quite important. Uh, and in terms of some of the pitfalls, uh, one of the things that we really like to do, I think at the end of every board meet, uh, meeting is to actually have a, a sign a board member to have a one-on-one. -on -one. I think closing the feedback, oftentimes it's difficult to communicate in a very formal setting uh, so in our board meetings, we typically have uh, the normal board meeting, executive session, and afterwards, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one download where 
um, the board members will kind of get together without the management team and then afterwards assign someone to give some feedback. Uh, maybe that's something that's hard to say in a formal setting, something that you could be doing better uh, or something that you're not doing um, that you should be doing. Um, so oftentimes David and I will get together afterwards uh, you know, and just kind of uh, have coffee or something and then talk through some of the, some, some of the more, more, you know, uh, softer items. What happens when board members vehemently disagree and how, do, how does that get mediated? You uh, scream back. I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so let's say if you didn't have an odd number of board members and you had an even number and there was a tie, what, in what case? what's done, or is it never even? Uh, I can jump yeah. in. If, if, okay. I mean, I think one thing that I think a lot of founders think in their head that these board meetings are like hotly contested and there's these crazy votes that happen, like 99.9% .9 of the time, everyone votes for something, it's like granting options, it's not hotly contested. The two things that always matter are like, the, the next financing, like like everyone said here, your board members need to approve the next financing. They need to be on board with the next investor. And M&A events, uh, liquidity, IPO, M&A events, that's where all the magic like happens and all the uh, really tough decisions occur. But most day-to-day -day board meetings, they may have some disagreements or different opinions, but the actual like corporate votes are, are always unanimous. It's really um, when you get into M&A events and people are really concerned is when you get into these situations. Um, and that's generally where you have uh, votes that uh, may not be unanimous. And the reason is, is because you have different incentives with your Series C board members and your later stage Series D board members. And they have completely different economic incentives to sell the company for 100 million versus 500 million. Um, and that's where uh, you, you run into disagreements most of the time. What kind of topics are the ones that get voted on? Like meeting what, what determines a vote? Stock grants, both of which are pretty inconsequential. Uh, meeting minutes is like, is this what we said at the last board meeting? Yes, this, this sounds like what we said. All approved, <laughs> cool. And then option grants, like we just had an engineer going to grant him, 10, 000, him or her 10,000 options. Everyone cool? It's like, Okay, cool. And most of these things are these days because with like Carta and you know Atrium, you can most of these are actually done done through via email now. We actually don't spend too much time in actual board meetings. Um, and then you know like with financings, uh, approving a term sheet, uh, approving an M and A, especially when you have like different liquidation preferences and people will get different amounts of money back. That's when it gets really contentious, and you have to then deal with that offline uh, because you're not going to deal with that at a board meeting. Are board members compensated? Depends. If so, like, is there a range? How does it work? Does, what if they have to travel to the meeting? Is that paid for? How, is that, how does that work? So the travel part is negotiated differently with different term sheets. Um, I think board members usually, if they have to travel, are compensated up to a certain amount. Uh, when it comes to actual cash or stock compensation, it, again, depends on every single board. Sometimes board members of particular funds are given um, stock grants, even if they're part of a fund and they've already invested. Uh, they're usually not compensated via cash, um, but independent board members who you brought in that are not investors are usually given uh, advisory grants. And the best way to do that is actually not just to give you know a, a grant and have them be on the board, but have those grants be milestone based and have them say like, if you unlock three partnerships for me per year or this many introductions, then you unlock the, the option grants. The only other thing I'll add that sometimes boards do have um, kind of voting rights over, and Ryan, you can tell me if this is market or not, is um, the kind of, uh, increase in founder salary or major changes in founder salary usually it's above a certain percentage change um, and if that is a, a topic you want to discuss i highly recommend since it's highly personal to you and you're in the room discussing it to try to bring as many kind of market comparables and other outside data into that conversation as possible because your board is going to want to be fair and thoughtful but they're also going to realize you're incentivized to ask for the most money that you you, you may need and so it's kind of a give and take there and trying to ground it in fact is a really helpful way to have that conversation if a founder chooses not to take VC funds aka raise a price round uh, maybe bootstraps crowd funds and becomes customer backed is it still necessary to consider having a board this is an open question so anybody can answer I think it's always good to um, 
have people around you that will support you to disagree with you um, and to structure it so that you have some you know check-ins with with people around the table uh, so maybe in that perspective it's more of an advisory board uh, but I think as a founder I find it actually really helpful uh, sometimes to be challenged uh, and to to have a sounding board uh, of a group around the table. So even if you don't need the money or you could, you know, which is kudos, um, I think it's important to have a group of people around the table that can support you. Going back to advisors for like a hot second, what are some of the standard terms in an advisor agreement? Allison, feel free to take this one. If, uh... So it's really kind of on the gamut. I think you're going to see there are or there are going to be some people who are willing to be an advisor solely based on a kind of small equity grant that is typically on a vesting schedule and earned. There are going to be others that may have a bigger name and come in and require some upfront cash compensation in addition to an equity grant. What you want to make sure is that on the whole, that advisor is their incentives are aligned properly with yours. So if they are just solely paid a kind of large cash sum upfront. Their longer term incentives to build the business are going to be a little bit different because they don't have that skin in the game in terms of equity. So I would encourage any type of advisor, if you are kind of out of the gate trying to think through how to compensate them, I would default towards finding a way with kind of an equity grant to align your um, overall incentives. Lots of questions here. What are the biggest issues you've seen regarding M&A and boards? Different series of investors having different, again, incentives, like Ryan mentioned. Um, for example, we, we had a company that we wanted to sell, but the, we invested at the Series A and the Series C invested, invested at a much higher valuation. For us, we would have gotten our money back. For the Series C investor, they would have gotten back a third of their money. A lot of negotiation and a lot of us giving up certain things or even saying that we'll... Uh, we were, luckily, at the time, we were, we were talking to them about a different financing, about a company that they wanted to invest in, so we actually um, gave a few things away on that one in order for them to let us approve this, this M&A. But at that point, it's just a very hard discussion. Understandable. Yeah. Um, how do you prepare a board member or advisor agreements? How do I get a lawyer? Do I need one? This is a question from the audience, obviously. So Ryan, if you want to take this one. Yeah, sure. Uh, board member agreements are generally going to be within the context of a venture financing. So it's nothing to really lose sleep over. You're going to generally have legal representation. I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, most Advisor agreements you can generally find online. If you're kind of bootstrapping and running your company, um, you know most advisor agreements online, I would uh, kind of be okay with, which other lawyers may say something totally different, but you know that's just kind of how we are. At Atrium, it's like run the company. Um, if you're doing a lot of equity grants and it's getting really complicated with, with kind of the negotiation, you wanna bring in a lawyer, but if it's just kind of a, a standard advisor agreement, there's a lot online that you generally can't go wrong with. The reason I say that is the main thing you need to worry about with advisor agreements is, is not having the intellectual property uh, locked into the company itself. And anyone you work with, if it's a professor at your school or maybe an old mentor, if you don't really have the uh, knowledge that they give you and have it locked into the company itself, which will generally be in 99% of most advisor agreements, um, then you'll run into issues later on. So we've talked about the possibility of like a founder being removed by the board. Um, is there any way that a founder can avoid that from happening to them or is it just kind of inevitable? Anything, any, anything you wanna to say to that? Justin on the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> Questions about being fired. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, they, yeah. they keep it's coming ominous. in. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can personally speak to that, but I, th I think you should. Sure. Um, I think uh, Ryan mentioned this earlier. So it's you know structure as a board vote. So it depends on you know your votes and how secure they are and um, how your board seat is structured. So that's a that's the technical answer that I think Ryan gave earlier. I guess I'll speak a little bit to how to avoid being fired. Uh, or keeping your board kind of happy if you don't have the votes to keep yourself in the seat. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, I think founders oftentimes have a hard time dealing with the fact that I, at one point, owned 100% of this company, and over the rounds from C to, uh, you know, angel to C to A to B, uh, now I own 25%, 30%, and that's hard to deal with. And uh, I think a lot of times founders feel like that they, because they are in the day-to-day, that investor just along for the ride. 
So I think that's a re really bad mentality. And having been an investor myself, um, I, you know, I think you have to be prepared that as you're bringing on capital, right? That capital does come with the fact that now you're diluting your ownership. Uh, I think you have to be upfront with yourself about that. Um, and then ultimately, you know, sometimes it, there is a time uh, and certain founders, it's, there is a right time to move on. Uh, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of companies that a founder's great for taking it from zero to one, but scaling that business from one to a hundred is not their skill set. Or you need to bring on additional people, or you need to take a different role at the company, or take a step back. So I think those are real considerations. Yeah, and being self-aware, I feel like helps with that. Is like knowing your knowing your own limit. Yeah. Um, also, like I feel like when you're finding, I'm just gonna insert a s small piece of my own personal advice, but. When you're like finding an investor, you want to, there's a common concept of like pump and dump, right? Like where they just give you a bunch of money and they're like, okay, go figure it out. You obviously want to avoid that because you want to use your investors uh, connections and, uh, you know, experience to boost your company and go somewhere. And so you're not just like randomly picking a VC, but like the first one that gives you money and then they end up on your board. Like it usually doesn't work like that. You have you're like dating for a while, right? You're like talking to a lot of different VCs and you're kind of seeing where, who you connect with the best and they're seeing who, which one of you they connect with the best and, and then you find the right one, right? Just like in the real world when you date and then you're ready to like marry somebody and then, and then those people generally end up on your board. So I feel like a lot of these questions are, you know, can they, who, how do I find board members? Can, can when I remove a board member? I mean, generally speaking, when you're getting, when you're fundraising, it's a lot like dating and you, you're gonna wanna find people that you connect with and that understand you know, the value of your business and, and your passion and what you're interested in and where you wanna take it. Um, and generally when you no longer have that passion, that board member also is like, wait a minute, like what's happening here? Um, so let's see what else we have here. Maybe they need a Tinder for board members. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Okay, is it possible to issue stock from the option pool to board members? Generally, they already have stock, I feel like. Yeah, they, they can do that. I, just to go back to the, the board compensation, I, I have seen it in some term sheets where you get cash, but it's generally, the board members are there to, to get carry in their fund. Like, it, it giving them additional shares or cash, like, it, it may kind of, help a little bit in, in a weird way, but most VCs are there to, to really help you grow the company. And option pool shares, cash, like it, it's just not gonna really incentivize them more if, if that's kind of the thinking. It, it, tell me if I'm wrong. No, though, yeah, but. it's like, like we, we put in, you know, whatever, like 10 million into your company, we own 20%. Like that's gonna keep us pretty incentivized to make sure your company goes well. Granting like 50,000 shares is not gonna, it's not gonna change that, right? It's not gonna make us more in love with your company. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to try to hit some of these uh, questions here from the audience before we cap. So let's see, uh, do you have to pay advisors? So I mean, generally speaking, when I signed on an advisor, I gave them a small amount of equity, but you guys can speak to that if you want to. Yeah, it's mostly just equity. Uh, not yeah. Definitely not cash comp. I think any earlier stage startup that's paying a bunch of advisors, you should question that advisor's intentions. I generally gave like half a percent or a quarter of a percent depending on yep. how helpful I thought this advisor was gonna be. Um, Justin, yeah, anything you wanna add to that about how much equity you would give an advisor? Or... I think it depends on the stage of the company and the vision. Totally, uh, but in an early stage, which is generally what we're talking about. I think quarter percent, half percent is probably right. accurate. At, okay. at our stage today, we would not be giving away a quarter percent, but right. uh, I think at an earlier stage, uh, I could certainly see even more if they're really involved with the company. Um, you know, I've, I've um, seen companies give away 1%, even, even more to totally. an advisor that's very, very hands-on. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, can people pay to get a board seat? I don't that's generally how it works. kind of how we do it, right? <laughs> you gotta pay a lot, though. <laughs> it's, an, it's, it's an investment. Yeah, no, sorry, it's, it's, it's an investment. <laughs> Um, is there a scenario where you would bring on independent board members? Tons, yeah. Especially when, when you want, like, um, you know, a lot of boards are, uh, have a lot of the same types of people, where it's just like a lot of VCs and you want diversity of thought. You want someone from the industry, uh, you want someone with certain functional expertise, whether it's like 
growth, engineering, marketing. Um, oftentimes at a Series A or Series B, we'll negotiate that we'll have a preferred seat, common seat, and then we'll leave an independent seat that both common and preferred agree upon. Yeah, and, and just so people know, independent seat uh, in, in case the nomenclature is confusing means someone that is not represented by the company and is not represented by the investors, but is generally uh, an outsider. It's generally a retired CEO from another company in the space, or it's an active CEO um, in a company kind of in a tangent space that is friends with the VC is generally kind of how it works. The one thing to note about independent board members also is that early on, especially in kind of the seat or series A, um, when you are thinking about an independent seat, it can take time to find that person. So a lot of people are very excited about having an independent board seat, but then realize they haven't put in the work alongside the investor to figure out what the funnel of, op of candidates would be. And it's like another year before that seat's actually filled. Yep. So it's something to think ahead on. If you do have an independent seat, I would be planning and thinking who whom you might want in that seat and starting to um, discuss that in advance with the, the investor who would have to mutually agree on it. So if you have that independent seat, what would you look for in board members if you were thinking about that? I think a lot of board composition is trying to be complementary to your skill set as opposed, opposed to duplicative of, to the people that you already have on your board. So if you have a, a series of investors who are taking two or three of the seats, I would be really thoughtful about an outside perspective, perhaps someone who is not in the investing community that might have walked in your shoes and had many of the experiences a founder has had, or perhaps it's a specific expert that's needed for the type of business you're building, technical, marketing, whatever it might be. Um, but I would really try to think about someone who's bringing something new to the table as opposed to just trying to be trying to find someone who's going to vote the way you want them to vote um, because I just I think in the long run it's going to be a lot better to have more perspectives what well, would be like a red I would, flag um, I would actually disagree with that I think you want to find Ooh. someone who yes. uh, is like <laughs> one of your best friends that you can kind of trick the rest of the board into thinking we'll be independent. Um, I've, I've seen a number of like Loving late this. stage board situations where the independent board is someone who is friends with the VC and will side with the founder against the preferred investors. Um, and it, Wait, they're friends with the VC, but they side with oh, the founder? I apologize. Uh, yeah, they the, so you want someone, I, this is just what I've seen, and so I'm, I'm uh, out there, but some of our companies that uh, got an independent member on the board that was friends with the founder uh, versus someone who kind of is an outsider and more friends with the preferred, in later rounds, that independent board member basically saved the founder um, uh, from being voted out. So uh, from a corporate governance standpoint, when you go back to like, how do I not get fired? That tie-breaking vote is generally the independent and if it's an outside person you don't know very well that's friends with the VC, um, they'll side with the VC because they're friends with the VC. But if it's a founder, if it's a friend that's, you know, that the founder brings and you can really trust them with your job and your career, then they'll side with you. It's really good advice. Yep. As much yeah, as I, hate to admit it. I agree with <laughs> But usually an investor will I'm going to agree with Brad on that, that one. Yeah. <laughs> To add to that, this is not on our board, but at a previous board. <laughs> um, you know, I think the independent board member, uh, even if they're independent, I actually think they're more likely to side with the VC in a coin toss because they're incentivized. You got one company, the VC's got, I don't know, 30, 40, 50. So if they're thinking about their future and what, who they're gonna be involved in, especially if you have some big name VCs on your board, that independent member will probably flip towards the VC. Absolutely. We, we actually have an uh, independent board that we haven't built yet on yeah. the large board. <laughs> we're taking, put a lot we're of taking brads. We'll <laughs> All right, let's see what's left here. If there's anything. Uh, okay, so this is a little bit longer one. In a pre-product startup, if you have the seed money, the pilot customer, the product vision, and the tech skills, what value can a board provide for the founders? Generally, they can open doors for you. Next round of financing, it's really important to have that lead investor go out and market it to uh, exist other investors. Um, nothing kind of, well, not, nothing really beats when, you, when you're financing other VCs talking about a particular company, uh, saying like, oh, have you heard so-and-so is gonna raise? So having that lead investor generate that buzz and go speak to other investors they're friendly with is really helpful and can expedite a fundraising process. If you guys have any last questions, please enter them in Slido. In the meantime, 
what are the top two ways a founder can build and leverage a board effectively so it becomes an incredible source of value add? Feel free to anybody input on this one. Justin. Uh, I guess I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I would emphasize building one-on-one relationships with all your board members. Uh, they have different personalities. Uh, they have diff different strengths uh, and weaknesses. They're human. Just like any other relationship, uh, just like dating, for example, I think you do want to, you got to put in the time. Uh, you got to put in the time uh, and in different ways, probably. It's like you don't have the same relationship with your probably your friends, right? They, they're all a little bit different uh, and you have to work it a little bit differently. Uh, and I will also say that it, because it is, um, I think quite, sometimes it could be quite lonely at the top as a founder or as a CEO, um, you know, you do, your board members are the ones that you actually talk about some of the issues with. So compatibility uh, that was mentioned earlier, I think, and cultural fit is also very important because you can't, you can, you know, you can't sit down with your customer success manager and talk about how you think you're going to run out of money in four months or <laughs> anything like this, but you can with your board members. So that's important um, to have a, uh, you know, someone to bounce off ideas as well. The only other thing I'll add is I know tonight we talked a lot about the contentious situations about potentially being fired, about, you know, taking sides. Seems to be a general concern in here. <laughs> yes, which, is, which, you know, does that ultimately happen, and Ryan probably can speak to that better than anyone. But in general, I think when you have good rapport with your board, there's not going to be a situation where, you know, out of nowhere, you're suddenly fired. Because usually everyone is aligned with having those hard conversations in advance over a period of time to kind of get to an ultimate decision that everyone is is comfortable with so I want to kind of paint the picture that a lot of boards are fully functioning you know get along um, are excited to support you but I think it means finding the people that you really click with and can um, be very open to feedback from I think that's an attribute we look for a lot in founders is what is their openness to disagreement their openness to being challenged their openness to being wrong um, I think those are critical parts of being a successful founder and it comes into play with your board because they are probably going to say something things that may be controversial or maybe different than how you thought about it. And I think it's through those conversations you build a relationship where you aren't surprised by being fired the next day. Um, so I, I definitely, I, no, I, I want to emphasize that because I know today we talked a lot about the more edge cases. I think on the whole, there is a, a board that um, can be very harmonious um, going forward. Uh, if you guys ha actually have any questions that you don't want to enter in Slido, you want to shout it out, yeah, go for it. What would be a good resource out and search for different investors that would be in a particular field. Crunchbase, PitchBook, CB Insights, sort by vertical, probably the best starting place. And then after that, kind of just ask, asking other, other startups that have raised money, similar startups in your space. Yeah, AngelList is good. Sometimes they'll have AngelList syndicates based on a certain industry, and those people are more likely to kind of be open to cold emails, and they have relationships with investors as well. Thing, swap. Yes. Should a founder be concerned about differing political views across board members, or would that be a good sign of diversity within the board? Generally, it's not been an issue on the boards I've served on, but I, I do think it probably goes back to what type of company it is, if that is relevant to the kind of go forward strategy. But on the whole, I think diversity is a, a positive thing. Okay, we have time for one last question. Anybody else? Yes. If you're choosing an investor, especially a Series A, how do you get some intelligence on how people act on their boards, what they do for you? Uh, so as part of diligence, investors will oftentimes ask for team references on the management team. So likewise, you should reference these investors by asking to talk to their portfolio companies. And generally, we recommend our portfolio companies ask to talk uh, about, uh, or rather ask the new investors to talk about companies that didn't go so well. So none, not the companies that made a lot of money, but companies that either sold for 1x or companies where um, the team maybe didn't return any capital and the team had to find a soft landing spot for them where the investors made no money because that's when the contentious votes happen and you'll probably get the most color on those ones. Great. Yep. All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining us.